Thank you everybody for being here. And we are here with Matt Knapper of Lighthouse Messianic Fellowship. You can see the sign on the wall behind him. Uh, Matt is a is a pastor that one of the pastors there at Lighthouse Messianic Fellowship. Um, he has a Master of Arts in Biblical Studies from Amridge University and is currently working on his PhD. Uh, he's a 21-year veteran, uh, National Guard, and father too, right? Yeah, so um, father to five kids, actually. Awesome. Uh, so if you hear some kids in the background, we have, a, we have a modest house, and so my office mm -hmm. is connected directly to the living room. So if you hear some kids in the hallway, I apologize. That's all right. All right, so the topic is the history of the Bible, and especially English translations, but really the Bible as a whole. How did we get from, you know, prophets and, and shepherds and kings and all these people writing on, you know, part on, well, I don't know, even know if they would have used parchment, but uh, on skins and tablets and, and uh, papyrus, and now we've got you know, a dozen Bibles in every home practically and an infinite number available on our devices. So how did we get from there to here? So Matt, um, I know that the history of the Bible is pretty complicated. It, there, we started with all of these different writings, you know, the scrolls and, and whatnot that were, uh, you know, different people had different collections of scrolls. You know, one library might've had uh, you know, five or six of the prophets and a copy of the Torah and another library had some of the writings, maybe Psalms and Proverbs. And, uh, you know, then we get the Christian church that comes along and then we've got a bunch more manuscripts to add to the collection. And there's some disagreement about which ones belong and which ones don't. And eventually somebody, I don't, I don't know if Jerome was the first one, but, um, you know, somebody puts them all together in a single codex what they used to call a book or what we now call what what passed for a book almost mm -hmm. 2000 years ago. Um, but a lot happened in between all that and between, you know, Jerome and his Latin translation up to today, there's a lot going on between that and the complete Jewish Bible. So uh, first off, tell us a little bit more about yourself. You know, what's your background? How did you get interested in this topic? And uh, how did you get from wherever it is you started to where you are now? Yeah, sure. Uh, first off, I uh, appreciate being here. It's an, it's an honor to be a part of the Bible study. I, I was chatting with Jay beforehand. I, I told him it's a genius uh, title for a Bible study. It's Common Sense Bible Study. I think it's very inclusive. It, it, it's an inviting uh, title, so I really appreciate that. Um, and I love conversations about the Bible more so than I do teaching or preaching, so uh, I really love being here. My name is Matt Knapper. I guess as everyone knows, you say it without the I, we could get into linguistics of my last name. <laughs> Plays very similar into how we talk about things in the Bible. Uh, it was originally Napier, N-A-E-P-E-E-R, in uh, uh, Scotland. Uh, you may notice it with one P. Uh, there's a jeweler out there, and uh, the father of uh, algorithms and mathematics had it with one P, all, all the same strain of uh, lineage for me, but um, I'm in Northeast Louisiana, West Monroe, kind of outside of that. Uh, if you can call it a suburb of a suburb, uh, I live out in the country on 60 acres, but I grew up in West Monroe, home of Duck Dynasty. So those bearded guys that duck hunt, that's where we're at. Our Sukkot every year, uh, pass or excuse me, Tabernacles. For if if anybody's not familiar with that, we do a week long Tabernacles at a place called Camp Chioka, which is uh, owned and run by. Uh, all of those guys, the Robertsons, and uh, they're they're great people. Um, so that's the area I'm in. I'm married to an amazing woman named Melissa. Of course, my name is Matt. I have five children, Mariah, Maya, Michaela, Malachi, and Michael. And we have a dog named Molly, a standard poodle. And so we uh, went with the M names. It was fun. Uh, I am a 21-year uh, veteran. I say veteran. I'm, I'm still on active duty, actually. Last week was, uh, last Wednesday was my last day on duty. Uh, so you can see I haven't shaved in, in uh, almost a week, but uh, it was my last week on duty. So uh, I'll be retired. My retirement date is August 31st from active duty. So um, that's been a great, you know, lesson and time of my life. It's given me a lot of lessons that have helped me in my walk with God. It's given me an opportunity to express faith and 
help others uh, grow towards Christ or, or come to know Christ. So that's been a great blessing. Um, it's a blessing at this point in my life, a transition where God will provide in ways that helps me do ministry and, and other streams as well. So um, years ago, we started a congregation here locally. It started from uh, a, one little Bible study, a common sense Bible study. We had me and, and two other older gentlemen were doing a Bible study after church on Sundays, and we um, weren't getting, we felt like we weren't, we needed more. We wanted to dig in deeper, and so we were doing that uh, for, you know, months and months, and one of the gentlemen, he's still a, a real good member of our church, and that he said one day, he said, uh, guys, I think we should be doing this yesterday. And I laughed and I said, what are you talking about, Bill? And he said, well, the Sabbath is is the day that we should rest and meet and fellowship. And and so that kind of started a, a really organic journey into understanding the full Bible. This was back 2006 or seven. And um, that grew into a house church that grew into two house churches, three house churches. And then in 2016, we came back together together. Uh, the three house churches uh, came back together and created a, a local congregation. So uh, I co-lead with two other guys, Layman Tucker, Nathan Hall. Uh, we've all been co-vocational, so it's been great. Um, with this transition in my life, I've taken that on full time. At, at the same time in 2016, I decided to go back to school. I had an undergraduate in sociology from uh, the University of Louisiana at Monroe that is right here where, where I live. And um, I wasn't going to do much with that. And I thought, well, the Army will pay for a master's as well. So let's let the Army pay for me to learn Hebrew and Greek or something. Uh, fell in love with education of the Bible. And to your question um, on what got me into this topic, I think as I looked back on my education, at least my master's, um, I thought about what was the most impactful class. And I think it may have been this one, partly because it, it was unexpectedly impactful. Uh, it was a required core class, and I thought, well, this will be just a check the block, it's, you know, nothing to it. And I think going and digging into this topic really transformed the way that I read the Bible, the way that I live out the Bible, and the way that I share the Bible, uh, how I study the Bible. It's so, so very much ingrained in, in everything about also some big overarching uh, themes when it comes to the history of the Bible that really helps us understand how to live it out better too. So I, I think that long-winded answer is is the answer to more of an introduction and why this topic is important to me. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, I apologize if I, my internet is uh, a little unstable. I cut out there for a few seconds. Oh, okay. Um, your, you know, your uh, last name, uh, we were actually speculating that it was French and maybe Napier or something like that. Um, so I was a little surprised that it was Scottish. So I live in Louisiana where everybody mm. thinks everything's French. Uh, my whole yep. family actually growing up said it was French and um, it, it's it's Scottish. Uh, it was a title, like many things in our Bible, it was a title that became a name. So um, Napier meant like none other. Nice. Hold on just a second. Sorry, we're trying to uh, uh, increase our bandwidth here. Um, yeah, so, sorry, I got a little distracted and lost my train of thought. Um, no, that's, I, I can go right into kind of those bigger overarching things if you want me to, and you can kind of get back on track with where you wanted to go or... or yeah, well, why don't you start by just telling us, uh, tell us the whole history of the Bible. Where did it start? Where did it end? Yeah, yeah, it started <laughs> uh, thousands of years ago, and it hasn't ended yet. So, um, you know, there's there's a few main points that I always start a Bible class. I've taught a 15-week class twice now. Um, I taught it strictly online during COVID, and then I taught it uh, through my, my congregation uh, in the fall, this past fall, that was streamed live. And so if you go to Lighthouse Messianic Fellowship on, on YouTube, you can see the playlist and, and you can get 15 weeks of full discussion of all this. But 
I always start out with the, the first week uh, of this class is always a discussion about uh, the importance of the Bible, less about the details and and why it's important. I mean, this is God's word. And so, um, you know, there's a few things that I think are important and, and why we should study this. It helps us have confidence in the in, in the scriptures. Um, I think that a lot of people get thrown a lot of different concepts in the modern information age that, well, this Bible has been passed down and mistranslated and misused and and all these things well when we really hone in on on the history of it it actually gives us gives us confidence in the scriptures um it's god's word so it's very important for that aspect but one thing that i think a lot of people don't um think about in this in in this uh topic is our place in its history which is important uh, the Bible is a uh, an artwork of speech. It's how God has spoken mm -hmm. to us, but it's not how he first spoke to us. And so when we think about the history of God's revelation of his word to mankind, um, we see a, a trajectory that uh, I know we like circular things and seasons, but there is a trajectory. We are headed somewhere. And so, um, you know, first he speaks, he, he speaks into existence. He speaks to two people who then uh, create a distance between God and his word and his presence. And um, as history goes along, he speaks to people here and there. And um, eventually he gets to where he has a nation. And I think that's important for the history of the Bible. It's understood that understand that God did not give us uh, any written version of his word until he had a community to give it to. And so it's always important to understand that his word was intended to be uh, read, heard, uh, understood, studied, and lived out in a community uh, context. Um, and then as it progresses, you know, people couldn't read or write. They're hearing uh, the word being read by those who could. Uh, and then we get to a place where uh, then, you know, uh, technology allows for many versions of it to go out. Uh, then we get to a place where uh, it goes out in many versions in, in the languages in which people can understand it. And so where we're at today is we have God's word and it's in every household, which has only been a uh, the case for just a couple, you know, really about 300 years. Uh, and when we think about the span of the history of God's, uh, you know, redemptive plan, uh, redemptive history that I like to call it, uh, that's very a, a very small portion of time. And so why is that important? Well, when we get things like, how do we hear God and how does God speak? And sometimes we want to hear God speak in the way that Moses heard God speak, or we want to hear God speak in the way that Jeremiah you know, spoke God's words. Uh, but today we have a different, we think it's less today, but we actually have a greater opportunity today where every one of us has the opportunity to go out and speak his words because we can all read them in our homes daily. It's a blessing that I think we often take it for granted. Um, you know, it's the old meme where it says, you know, I want to hear God speak. Well, read the Bible. No, I want to hear him speak audibly. Well, read it out loud. And uh, you can hear him speak audibly. So exactly. Uh, <laughs> those are some, some, some of the more important things. Understanding our place in the history of the Bible helps us understand how to share God's word, how to uh, be confident that we're receiving God's word and, and um, how to live it out better. Yeah, I've been working on a series about, uh, you know, who wrote the Bible. You know, we have traditions about who wrote specific books, but do the traditions match what the text says or what the evidence ha says? In, uh, I sent out an email to my subscriber list a couple of months ago about, you know, some of the things I had learned about uh, the Torah and Judges and Joshua, and how the book of Genesis may have been compiled from multiple older sources that Moses had access to. And, you know, no doubt that, that Moses compiled it, or they, you know, he, he took these various sources and put them into one document. At least I don't have any doubt about that. I know there are a lot of scholars who disagree. Um, but even saying that, you know, there were, there seemed to be 10 different older scrolls that Moses collected together and made into one document, someone replied to me that I'm going to make people doubt their faith. Well, what do you, what exactly do you have faith in? 
you have faith that uh, that the Bible is inspired the way that you were taught in Sunday school, or do you have faith in God? You have faith that He's going to tell you what what you need to know through the Scriptures. Um, you know, I'm I'm not necessarily one who believes the idea of uh, um, that God will always preserve all of His Word totally intact. You know, we'll never lose any of it. Obviously, there are a lot of prophets who who you know mm-hmm. delivered the Word of God to people, and we don't have a record of what they said. Mm-hmm. And there were hundreds of years where ancient Israel didn't have the Torah, or at least a big section of it, and that's in the scriptures themselves. So the scriptures refute that idea. So mm-hmm. if we're going to have confidence in the scriptures, we need to be willing to accept the truth about them, that they're not just um, – they weren't like a, a direct download from God into somebody's brain, and they just spilled it out on paper. There's this long history of – people accumulating works and writing down their memoirs and like, yeah, 50 years ago, God told me this thing or this thing happened with me, between me and God and I'm telling you about it. So, you know, then that person tells their children and that person tells their children until finally Moses writes it all down or, you know, somebody, uh, Isaiah over his lifetime has given so many different prophecies and maybe his students or the descendants of his students gather all these scrolls up together and put them in a single book. And we know that even in the book of Proverbs, it actually says that this is what happened, that you know, many chapters were written by Solomon with influence from even foreigners. And, but then he left off and had all these other Proverbs and all these other writings scattered around the kingdom, who knows where, and King Hezekiah commission some people like go go out and find all this stuff from solomon and let's put it in one book and this gradual this accumulation of scriptures over time i think is a great testament to to the way that god works in in the way that he reveals truth to people and this shouldn't be scary to people it shouldn't cause them to doubt their faith to realize that something they were taught about the history of the bible might not necessarily be true that's putting faith in your sunday school teacher instead of in god that's right. Uh, you you said so much there. I had to take notes. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Of really important I got stuff. carried away. No, that's good. There's a lot of really important stuff that you said there, and I think we should unpack some of those things. Um, I, I want to start with just the Torah and your first comments there that you sent up an email. You said Genesis and 10. I'm uh, assuming you're re- referring to the Toledot uh, breakdown of Genesis, uh, the generations. Is that the demarcations you saw? Yeah, the different, the various genealogies. That genealogies, yeah. Yeah. Each, genealogy. each section yeah. either ends or begins with a genealogy. Right. Yeah, and, and you could take it a step further. So, um, I, I, part of my introduction, I didn't explain kind of where my focus has gone, but um, we'll go there in a minute. But I, I wanted to talk about the Torah because I had a similar conversation last year as I was teaching this topic, and we were talking about Deuteronomy, and I just what you said. I explained that there are scholars out there that would say that not only was it not written by Moses, it was written by many other people, possibly. And I had a gentleman in our congregation become pretty upset with me. And, um, you know, I'm pretty gentle. Uh, Sometimes people can't tell that on Facebook. I'm trying to move more towards video uh, stuff so people can see, but I'm pretty gentle. So I kind of pulled him aside and we talked through it. And I said, you know, here's the thing. Does the authorship of Deuteronomy change the message God intended you to learn from it? And, you know, he thought about it for a second and he said, no. I said, okay, so the message is the same, right? Yeah. So so authorship doesn't matter. Uh, not so much. I mean, authorship does matter when we're doing in-depth Bible studies, but it doesn't matter to the point that we can just um, catastrophize this idea. You know, if Moses didn't write it, then what can we trust? Well, I would just simply ask, you mentioned a couple of other books, who wrote Joshua, who wrote Judges, who wrote Samuel Kings, who wrote Jonah, who wrote, uh, there's a bunch of uh, books that have no, uh, that the authorship is anonymous. So if authorship is needed for us to be able to have faith in, and trust the message that God gave through it, then we're going to have some problems throughout all the scriptures. Uh, when it came to uh, Genesis and and Deuteronomy and Numbers, uh, 
uh, I would agree with you that I think at some point, you know, Moses compiles some former uh, stories. And, and and I think that that is one of my bigger points of understanding the history of the Bible is that the majority of the Bible is written down in hindsight. I, I think if you if you maybe were like me for years, I thought, well, as Jeremiah was prophesying, he was writing down his prophecies and eventually he got to the end of his life and he had written it all down and he just handed it over. That's that's not how it happened. Um, and there's important things to understand from that. There's intentionality in the way that people record history in the Bible. Uh, for us today in the 21st century, we we want to record every detail and get every fact right. Um, that's not the intention of the biblical authors. They're telling the story in hindsight with the intent to teach a theological message. Uh, they're okay mixing up the stories a little bit or changing and shifting up the perspective a little bit so that we, the reader and the hearer, will understand the intended message. I, I always use the Gospels as an example. Um, we always look at the four Gospels and people say, well, why are they so different? Well, John was standing over here and Matthew's over here and Mark's over here. So they're, they're just seeing it from different angles. Um, that's really a discredit to the beautiful artistry of the Gospels. And I always use Matthew to prove this point, Matthew and Luke. Matthew, for one, teaches and, and writes his gospel in the format of the Exodus story. His intent is to show Yeshua as Jesus, as the um, new Moses and his death, burial, and resurrection as the new Exodus, uh, the freedom of bondage to slavery, uh, slavery to sin and death. Uh, John is a new creation. He's, he's wanting to intentionally write the gospel to show uh, the nature of, of Yeshua and his work to bring about a new creation in all of us. And then when it comes to Luke, I always ask the question, when were the feet of Jesus uh, washed? When were they beautified? When did, uh, when, did, when did he have his feet washed? And most people, I'm not going to put your Bible study on the, <laughs> on the spot, but most people would say towards the end of his ministry, right? Right before he goes to the cross, except for in Luke. Luke picks the story up and places it at the beginning because Luke intends for his audience to know that that Yeshua is the prophesied Messiah of Isaiah. And so he places, he groups a bunch of Isaiah fulfillments together. And so today you would have a critic, many critics do point that out. They say, well, see, the gospels can't be trusted because Luke moves this story to the beginning of his ministry. And we try to create, we try to, you know, jump through these loopholes to say, well, his feet were washed twice. We don't have to do that if we understand how the Bible uh, was written. And when it comes to the Torah and Moses compiling these things up in hindsight, I think it also goes forward. There's a few things that I always point out. I do believe Moses had a hand in writing. There are places where God specifically tells him to write down certain stories. Um, I, I don't, I'm not a uh, documentary hypothesis guy. I'm not a fan of that. I think it goes, it has gone to the nth degree. Now they're trying to roll it back and, and, and trying to make sense of it a little bit better. But uh, we have places where like Dan, for instance, there's a place in Genesis where it talks about the region of Dan. Well, how's it, how's the Bible talking about the region of Dan in the book of Genesis? Dan's only called Dan because the tribe of Dan goes into the land and it establishes mm -hmm. their place in northern Israel. And so the, the, the reality of it is it would be like me today saying, um, you know, such as, you know, the uh, I'm trying to think. I don't know much about Native American history, but um, was it the Seminole Indians are in Florida? It would be like me saying, you know, the Seminole Indians set up on the border of Florida and Georgia. Well, Florida and Georgia didn't exist back then, but it's a reference to the modern audience. And so you you have that, and then you have two other spots that are unique. One is the burial of Moses. It says, you know, no one knows where Moses was buried. Well, if Josh was writing the end of Deuteronomy, how did he forget so quickly where his predecessor mm -hmm. was buried? And then Numbers, my, my favorite one, is Moses was the most humble man who ever lived. Well, that's quite an inter interesting statement for Moses himself to write. Um, so I think it goes even beyond Moses, where we have 
editorial notes. We have uh, later compilers who are also writing notes in the text, and that doesn't take away. Uh, we act as if God can only inspire the first inscription, but doesn't have any hand in the process of transmission, of editing, of uh, copying, all of those things. You know, I, I firmly believe that God has his hand. There's inspiration in the hand of the whole process. So I think that hit on some of what you were saying, and I'll kind of uh, let you jump in there a little bit. Yeah. Um... Sorry, I was just listening. You know, one of the one of the books that you know everybody loves to argue about is Hebrews. Like, who who wrote Hebrews? Yeah. And people would like to say Paul, except that the writing style is so different from Paul's. The ideas are similar, but the writing style is different. From my understanding, I mean, I I can barely sound out the Greek letters, let alone read it. So I'm no judge. I can't judge the literary quality of any of the New Testament books. But from what I've read. Hebrews and uh, Luke's writings are the best Greek in the New Testament, mm -hmm. but Hebrews is the best by far. It's the most literary stylistic. Mm -hmm. uh, whoever wrote it was an expert. He wasn't, he wasn't just some Joe Schmo who decided he needed to write something. He was somebody who was trained as a scribe, and uh, uh, he was trained in the literary arts in Greek. And you know, my favorite hypothesis for the authorship is Apollos. But just because he gets this slight mention as being an educated man from Alexandria. So yeah. that kind of makes sense. And he was associated with Paul. But nobody knows. But we all accept Hebrews. I mean, with a few exceptions, we all accept Hebrews as an inspired work. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. Uh, there's some other similar texts in the New Testament, um, mainly the pastoral epistles that were, uh, that still are the topic of much debate as to whether Paul wrote. Uh, the pastoral epistles, Second uh, Peter, uh, well, First Peter, Second Peter, and uh, Titus. Um, you know, I'm not sure where I stand with that, but uh, when we think about the history of the Bible, Bible, it's not a modern discussion that's being had. Second uh, Peter, for example, was withheld from the canon for hundreds of years for that very reason. They couldn't determine if it truly was written by Paul or not. Um, I think that where I'm at, I mean, excuse me, Peter, uh, Peter or not. And so I think where where I'm at with it, again, is the message. Um, I, I think that uh, there seems to be some compilation that happens there. Second uh, Peter seems to be at least two letters that have been joined together. Um, so I think that causes some confusion, but I kind of rest a little bit leaning towards Peter, and that's kind of an unpopular opinion today, uh, second Peter being, you know, Peter himself as well. But, um, you know, those are some other New Testament uh, questions that are out there. But we have less there than we have in the Old Testament, simply because we're closer in history to that. We have many more manuscripts of the New Testament than we do of the Old Testament. And um, so you you have a little bit less discussion when it comes to the to the New Testament. Um, than the Old Testament, but they're still there. Uh, when we think about writing in hindsight, again, something you talked about with Moses and, and Genesis, a lot of people don't realize that the Gospels were written decades after the events. Um, and after the first letters, you know, I think it's a little debatable, but like Galatians is kind of understood to be the first New Testament writing to have been written by Paul. Uh, but the Gospels were written after that. So one of Paul's letters comes before the first Gospel writing. And so uh, that shouldn't be cause for concern. It, we should actually think, well, there was an intentional reason for writing down at that time period. And it's different for each one. So, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, for me, my PhD is Old Testament. So that's more where I'm familiar with. But um, I would place like Jeremiah, for example. Jeremiah and Ezekiel, at least. Isaiah is a little different, but Jeremiah and Ezekiel, I would place their composition shortly after the exile, while the exiles are still in Babylon. And those prophets wrote those scrolls initially as a source of comfort for those in exile. Uh, but it was written afterwards. It's not like either one of those are writing these things down during the uh, conquest of, of Jerusalem. But Jeremiah especially. I mean, he's writing that down. He sends it to 
Babylon or his scribe or whatever uh, sends it to Babylon to the exiles as a source of hope. And he was in exit. I mean, Egypt at the time, Egypt. wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He, he stayed. He remains in, in uh, Israel, ends up fleeing to Egypt. Um, interestingly, we have no record of his death. Um, but I think the scroll for me, that's why a part of why I place it early on. I think the scroll was completed while he was still alive and sent to the exiles to give them to give them a source mm -hmm. of hope. They they felt like, um, you know, God had, had abandoned them. Ezekiel the same. Ezekiel starts out with this beautiful picture of you were in our discussion. Uh, I think weren't you with me, Dina and Ryan about uh, Ezekiel? And mm -hmm. um, yep. chapter one, is this beautiful fiery fireworks throne. But the whole point of chapter one is that God's throne is mobile. So you know Ezekiel writes and opens his scroll to let them know that God is not contained to the throne that was in. Jerusalem, but can meet them where they're at. So those are some examples. I don't know if that's a little off track of where we're at, but talking about the composition and and how things got written, uh, those are some examples of the intentionality of writing, uh, writing mm -hmm. in hindsight, and uh, why understanding that's important. If we understand that Jer Jeremiah was written for that purpose in its initial writing, it helps us better understand what Jeremiah is saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which doesn't even bar m many of the prophecies in Jeremiah or some of the stuff in Ezekiel from having been given by God even before that. That's right. So when was it written and why was it written down? Because every prophecy that God gives isn't even intended to be written down, or maybe it doesn't seem there doesn't seem to be a point in writing it down at that moment. But then 15 years later, you think somebody may be thinking, you know, that could be really relevant again in. That prophecy that we had 15 years ago, that really speaks to what's going on today. So we better write this down because this is going to happen again. You know, that those kinds of things, it, it's, you, you never know. Uh, and the prophets don't necessarily tell us why they were writing things down. Moses, well, some of them do. Some of them say, God told me to write this down. So here you go. Mm -hmm. um, but what about, you know, we, we've been talking about how we got the scriptures themselves but what about after the scriptures were written mm -hmm. how did we get from uh the hebrew or even the septuagint into english yeah so uh yeah the long that's that's the more uh technical stuff so a little bit more about my educational background that's what i didn't enter uh didn't give earlier so i, I went in hoping the army would pay me to learn hebrew and I wanted to go in and, and study the Torah. One of my first classes was the Pentateuch. And um, so uh, I came out the other side. The one thing I never wanted to study was uh, Hebrew poetry or the prophets. I was not interested in the prophets at all. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience with prophets was uh, end time prophets who just, I felt like I viewed had manipulated the text to just make these doom and gloom. So I wanted to be as far away as possible as I could from, <laughs> from uh, the prophets and but by the end of my master's degree, I wrote my thesis on the book of Jeremiah and ended up going into a PhD in, in Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, and my, my dissertations on the book of Micah. So uh, that's just funny how God works in those ways. But yeah. uh, the prophets are, are a thing for me. But um, and my focus is really on uh, the literary aspect and the textual background. So what I mean by the literary aspect is a little bit like form criticism a little bit, but more so the literary design of scripture. Uh, when I was in my master's, my very last class, um, one of my professors asked me what I thought about the Bible or something. And I said, I feel like it's a, a work of art and most people can't see it that way. And he just smiled as big as he could. He said, that's an answer I never expected. And I, he said, that was really a uh, a unique answer in today's scholarship uh, mm -hmm. because it is a work of art. Things are placed there intentionally. Uh, things are placed there with a purpose. Um, but I've gone uh, where I'm at now with like Micah, for example. My dissertation is on Micah, translating the Hebrew text from the Masoretic text, translating the Septuagint text, the, the Greek, the OG, the Greek text of My Micah, comparing the two, discussing the differences and and their impact on modern translation. So that's kind of where we're at with your question here. And so we have um, 
you know, the scrolls were written down at a certain point. Another aspect of the history of the Bible is that the oral transmission of the stories was more important than the written transmission for many years. This isn't a, a, a comment about the oral Torah or anything like that. Just the oral transmission. Um, and this is just worldwide for, for the history of writing. Uh, things only began to be written down because we are men, mankind, I'll say. And so the first writings we have are contractual agreements um, because Jay, mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't trust Jay to pay me back. So I needed to write it down so I could prove to Jay he said he'd pay me back. That's really what it was about. Um, it moved from there. Um, one of my favorite sections is the early parts of the history of the Bible talking about writing, writing methods, writing materials, but it moved from there into a, a little more informal writing. And I said years ago, I, I made a statement, uh, one of my friends, he, he always brings it up, but I said, you know, man has not changed, only technology has. Um, there's nothing about mankind that's changed, only the technology, only the means of communication. We're, we're talking over Zoom right now. I've got a 4K camera. <laughs> I'm using a virtual mm -hmm. background of my bookshelf. Uh, but in the ancient world, they didn't have that. But I was reading through some ancient manuscripts in um, uh, Akkadian one time for, for the Akkadian class. And there was an ostraca that said, um, or an ostracon that said, um, basically, uh, hey, sis, this is Jay. Uh, tell mom I'm doing all right. And I hope you got the package from the courier that I'm sending this note from. Love you guys. Talk to you soon. And had his signature at the bottom. This was from like 4,000 years ago. Uh, really ancient piece of uh, pottery. And so it just, when I read that, when I had translated that for the class, I, I just sat back and I was like, man, nothing has changed. I would text that to, you know, my sister or something today. And so uh, not much has changed. But so we have this writing that happens. Um, we really don't have religious texts being written until really uh, not long before the Bible starts its composition. Uh, the Bible was written on scrolls initially. Uh, these were scrolls in the ancient world. You can imagine the process of uh, putting together animal skins or papyrus and sewing them together, making the scroll. It's a long and arduous task. And so only the most important uh, documents would have been written on a scroll. Uh, that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's where we have most of our religious texts in Greek, like the Greek myths and stuff like that. They're written on scrolls because they were important religious documents. Um, total different section of the ancient world, but we see the same thing in other cultures as well. So the Bible gets written on scrolls that are uh, compiled. And, and people sometimes ask the question, well, how do we not have any examples of the most ancient scrolls of the Old Testament? And, uh, you know, by nature, we don't have that. Uh, by nature, we, we don't have electronic writing. We can't save. They couldn't save the, the biblical text on a hard drive or the cloud. And these documents, by their very nature, would deteriorate. They would fall apart. And there would be an, uh, it would necessitate writing and copying new ones. Uh, which was an arduous task uh, in itself. And so we have these scrolls passed down, and, and, and most of what we have comes post-exilic, uh, after the exile. Most of our, our uh, documents um, that we have from the biblical text, the oldest inscription that we have of a biblical text comes from an amulet in the 7th century, which is right around the exile. It's a silver amulet. It's very small, and it just has a portion of uh, the, the ironic blessing from Numbers, um, where someone had written that down. Uh, the discussion is, is that the original and someone later put that, that common blessing in the Bible afterwards, or is that an inscription of the blessing from the Bible that existed in the, sc in the scrolls beforehand? Uh, interesting discussion, but that's the oldest inscription we have of the Bible, 7th century uh, BC um, or BCE. And so as these scrolls get passed forward, they, they make it to the exile, uh, we're assuming. I think there's more compilation that happens post-exile. Uh, 
they realize the nature of what could happen and how things could get lost if there's another catastrophe like the exile. And so they start compiling these things. Well, they lost their identity a bit. The, the biblical text actually tells us that they lost their identity somewhat. They lost their language. Um, they had to understand or be taught what it said. Um, they had to learn Hebrew. And as we go forward, that identity gets lost even more as things happen, like Alexander the Great sweeps through the entire empire of the Greeks. And so uh, you end up with an entire Israelite Jewish community that's by and large Greek speaking. And so uh, that required uh, translation into the uh, Greek text, the Septuagint, as uh, Jay and I have been talking about. So the oldest really manuscripts that we have or the oldest writings we have of the Old Testament come from the Septuagint, uh, the translation into Greek. Um, and I, I hope I'm headed your way. That's kind of a long-winded answer to get where I want it to be for uh, moving forward. Uh, what happens with the New Testament documents? Um, the New Testament documents get written down again, as I said, decades after Jesus, Yeshua, and his ministry. Uh, but they get sent out very quickly. They took the command to go out and to spread the gospel very serious. So we have manuscripts very early in the first century, second, or excuse me, second century, that are very widespread. They're found all over the ancient Near East, even up into Europe. And so we find that they've actually spread those out very fast. Interesting fact, we can almost give credit to uh, Christians, to the, to the Bible, for two main things. One, uh, pretty much the, the idea of a book, a codex, comes from having to compile these works of New Testament writings and send them out. Uh, prior to that, a, 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 a codex, a, a piece of paper, again, was like a sticky note at that time. Scrolls were still the thing. Uh, if you're writing something important, it was written on a scroll, but they were trying to write things hard and fast and get them out. And when it came to a loose leaf piece of paper, that was really like a, a sticky note. You you weren't writing important things on that. And then you weren't really compiling single pages on top of each other either and sending them out. So um, arguably, of course, the, the idea of a book comes from those New Testament writings. And two, there was a, an explosion of literacy that happens because of it. Uh, people want to, they have to understand what it reads, I mean, what it says. There's two phases of that. You have an explosion of literacy that happens after the first century with the New Testament writings, and also what happens in English. Um, whenever the Bible starts to be translated into English, uh, everyday people who were illiterate were, you know, paying $5 uh, virtually to borrow English copies and then teaching themselves to, to read English so that they could understand God's word for themselves. So you have those two developments that really come from this. Um, after the first, second century, when those things start to get compiled, they're in Greek and, um, you know, Latin becomes kind of the thing. You mentioned Jerome, which is one of my favorite people in history. Uh, Jerome actually, um, he, he takes on the task of, there's, there's Latin versions before Jerome, right? and they're called Old Latin. They're a little bit different. The Latin language changed, and so he compiles uh, what we know as the Latin Vulgate, LV, and uh, he gets in trouble uh, because he translates directly from Hebrew to Latin uh, instead of the Greek Septuagint. Their concept back then was, well, God gave the ancient Israelites the Old Testament in Hebrew, he obviously intended for us to know it in Greek, so the Greek was superior to the Hebrew for them. And sounds like some sounds like some arguments for the King James. That's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, and so he says, no, I think we would be better served knowing what the Hebrew says and going directly into Latin. So uh, I take trips to Israel, I lead trips to Israel every year, and I go to Bethlehem to uh, the Church of the Nativity for two reasons: one, to talk about the history of that church, but also there's a cave underneath the church, which is where Jerome lived for 15 years while he taught himself Hebrew and translated the Bible into Latin. Um, I had this sweet lady in our church when, when I was teaching this, she said, well, I think that's great, but don't you think he could have translated the Old Testament a little faster than 15 years? And I said, 
Uh, well, he didn't know Hebrew, and he's teaching it to himself first before he can do an accurate translation. He didn't have a Hebrew teacher. He didn't have, uh, you know, whatever Hebrew programs. We that have is today. crazy. <laughs> so he's taking Hebrew um, and and putting it next to a text he knows and teaching himself how to how to read Hebrew first and then doing the translational work. So he already knew Greek and he knew Latin, but um, that's what he did with Hebrew. Very important work. You brought up, um, I don't know if this is a good place to go into it. You brought up earlier um, the books that Jerome contained. So Jerome had a pretty good canon of what we would know today. And this is fourth century going into the fifth century, completed his work at the beginning of the fifth century. And so he has pretty much what we understand as the Old Testament and New Testament today. And then he included the apocryphal works. Um, this is what the Catholic Church uh, leans heavily on. But Jerome was very adamant that he wasn't including those works as inspired scripture, but was including those works just for their importance to basically a church library. Uh, that there would be uh, works that were understood as being sacred and inspired by God, and then other works that help basically with the history of uh, the people of God, which is the apocryphal works. Some people argue that his inclusion gave it credibility in the Bible, but uh, he separates them. Uh, if we're going to include some apocryphal works that, as they should be included, like in the Catholic Bible, they, we should see them uh, interspersed within the places that they would naturally find themselves in history, but we don't find that. So, um, so we have that going forward in Latin. Um, am I on track? Do you have any kind of comments or questions so far? Um, well, I know that there, there are probably going to be some questions about the, the Apocrypha and, you know, who, yeah. who added or removed what books when, yep. um, well, this, this be, oh, go ahead, there's sorry. a ton of territory to cover. So, yeah. And I'm cramming like a concept of 15, yeah. uh, 45 hours worth of material here in a, in a, yeah, we don't have 45 hours, unfortunately. So, All right. So the, another important concept, though, is what is a canon? And that's important mm -hmm. to understand in the history of the Bible. I think um, how we view the canon traditionally is that uh, the canon, or excuse me, the Bible has uh, authority because it's in the canon. Uh, but it's the other way around. It's in the canon because it had authority. Uh, it's just a paradigm shift. That, that that shift was important for me because it removes the argument of, well, who added and who took away? There, there's no adding and taking away. There's no um, let's make a canon. There's like a process that happens over centuries that's working itself out. Uh, some of the earliest canons we have, like the Muraturian canon, which is uh, very important, has a large list that's very close to our Bible today, but it excludes things like uh, Second Peter and Jude and um, Hebrews, actually excludes Hebrews, excludes Esther. Um, so those things get added as we go along, and it's, it's because there's not like this concept of we need to make a list of books that are for to be bound in a Bible, because that concept wasn't even there at the time. But it's not that those books have authority because someone put them into a binding or a list. They're in list because they naturally had authority already, if that makes sense. Uh, when it comes to the apocryphal works, even in the Septuagint, you know, they were included in the Septuagint in the Greek translation, but the translators translated them last. Uh, the first translators that began the work were dead and gone by the time the apocryphal works get translated. Uh, they clearly didn't have the same weight. Those don't get translated till uh, the first century BCE. So um, those things uh, don't just happen. Nobody had this idea, well, we need to make a, a perfect list and write these things down. Uh, you also have uh, differences of scrolls that happen throughout time as well. First, second Samuel, first, second Kings was really one big scroll called Kings. Uh, they're all one big um what they understood to be a prophecy as well. We view those as historical books. Anciently, that was prophecy. First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings, Second Kings. Um, so I think that concept of what is a canon is is uh, very important. So from that that place forward, is there any topic you know from maybe Jerome forward to 
the English translations, is there anything particular? I know I, I want to be mindful of time and give people, you know, ample time to jump in as well, but anything you want to cover from that point forward? Um, yeah, I know that, you know, you mentioned that before the King James Version, there were several other English translations. Um, were those translations that were created so that the average person could read the Bible or were these scholarly texts or what, what was the purpose? Well, a little bit of both. So when the English translations start to come, you, you kind of have uh, still uh, some illiteracy that's happening. So I always love, you know, when I read and I, I see a verse a different way, you know, faith comes by hearing. And when I was younger, I used to think, well, that just is Jay is sharing the gospel with me. Uh, no, faith comes by hearing because that's all anyone could do in the ancient world was hear someone who had the ability to read it, read it aloud. And so a lot of our, like the great Bible that comes out right after the King James, it's part of the transmission there for the English Bibles, was called the great Bible because it was huge. It was considered the church Bible because people were reading from it. Um, so it's it wasn't so much that uh, they were coming out so that people could understand them better. Um, the English language was changing, uh, and it starts to change pretty quickly at that time period. Uh, when we talk about King James, and we have a lot of people in the world who are King James only, right? They would only read the 1611 King James. It's in my other room. I should go, I should have brought it in here. I have a really nice uh, leather bound uh, facsimile copy of the 1611. So when someone tells me they only read the 1611, uh, I tell them nice. they don't, but they couldn't yeah. read that. You're reading like the 27th edition of the 1611 that's been updated in an English that you can understand. Uh, but also when we talk about the King James, I always point people to the uh, note to the, tra uh, the, the note from the translators. So in the original King James version, there was this great uh, introduction that the translators wrote, and it's really good. And the translators themselves say that their work should not be the end of all English translations because they understood that English would continue to change. And so their instruction was that there should be many translations to come afterward, mm -hmm. um, that we would need more and more English translations basically to keep up with, with the change in English language. So um you kind of yeah, have that you know there we're almost an hour in and i want to be able to open this up to everybody uh, i've got just to get it started i've got a question from somebody on youtube um okay you know when when paul wrote to timothy and said you know all scripture is breathed by god and, and and good for instruction um he wasn't referring to the new testament because it didn't exist yet so what scriptures would paul have considered canon yeah, so I think Paul would have understood the Old Testament scriptures when he when, when that's uh, being written. Uh, but actually, you know, Timothy does know Paul. And uh, there's, you know, the idea, the concept, um, you know, Peter speaks of Paul's writings and says that his words are twisted like the rest of scripture. Uh, he's actually associating the words and the work that God is doing through Paul at that time to be at the same level as the scriptures they know as well. So it's not the fullness of the New Testament. Uh, they didn't have that at the time, but they did understand, there was an understanding that what they were doing was inspired as well. What Paul was doing was inspired as well. So, uh, but yes, the majority of what's being understood at that time was um, that the Old Testament was in mind, but also some of the things that were happening in the communities, the, the writings of Paul, um, and really, at that time, uh, I would assume that at least the oral nature of the gospel message and the teachings of Yeshua, the teachings of Jesus, would have been in mind as well. Uh, I had my first class, and my master's was a hermeneutics class. I really loved it. Dr. Fletcher passed away. He had a lung transplant. He was only 40-something years old, and COVID hit, so a lung transplant and COVID doesn't really mix. Uh, he passed away. But he was a Sabbath keeper, so he preached at a, he was a preacher at a Church of Christ, a professor Monday through Friday, and he kept a strict Sabbath, Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. And he would not allow his students, or he encouraged his students not to work on school on the Sabbath. 
And we came to a part where one of my fellow students asked him, he said, are you saying that the Old Testament's not done away with? And he referenced the, the very writing in that question and said, I'm not saying anything. I'm telling you that if you asked the first century apostles and Jesus, they would tell you that the Old Testament was their constitution. It was what guided them, mm -hmm. what, what gave them direction. So, Yeah, um, well, there. I, from my understanding, there are, I don't, additions is probably the wrong way to put it, but the, uh, there were different collections of the Septuagint. Uh, you know, some included up to as many as 70 different scrolls and, you know, some pretty much matched what we have in our Old Testament today. So mm -hmm. how did we how did that get narrowed down? Well, some of um, some of those 70 something scrolls are um, apocryphal works as well in the Septuagint. Um, so some of those come down to what is inspired. Again, we're back to the question of the apocrypha. Um, and we. I think there's always a conspiratorial notion that Constantine took some things out. Um, that that absolutely never happened. That's one thing I always like to address. The Council of Nicaea didn't address a canon whatsoever. Um, that doesn't happen. Um, really, we don't see this conversation, a hardline conversation about the Apocrypha, until we get to the Reformation. Um, so some of those apocryphal works are tagging along in a lot of these translations, King James, for example. Uh, some of them are tagging along, uh, again, clearly delineated in those Bibles as being not so inspired. But you've got to understand, you look at my bookshelf behind me, uh, I have more books uh, than would have ever been contained in any of those collections. And uh, it's easily accessible to me. And, and then my online, my Logos uh library is exponentially greater i think i have like five thousand books in my logos library and they didn't have that so they're carrying along these works in translation because they don't have the same technology that we do but why do they fall off that's the question and, and the reformation is really kind of a pivot point for a lot uh for for both areas so the reformation happens and they address things in the catholic church and on the other side of the Reformation, just a few decades later, uh, the Catholics actually at that time solidify canon, and their canon includes the apocryphal works, but they don't call it the apocrypha. They call it the deuterocanon, the deuterocanonical works. And what does that mean? Anybody who's familiar with language? The second canon, the second canon, they, they understood even them that they're adding something that, that was done later that this wasn't necessarily understood to be a canon initially. And for me, as someone who's not Catholic, but I love Catholics, I have a lot of Catholic friends. I love a lot of the scholarship they do. But at the same time, I, I love history and I, I have my own suppositions. I, I carry, I think it's Lightfoot, and I have a list of books that are helpful references for people to learn more. But one of the main ones is, is the easiest to read is Lightfoot's How We Got the Bible. And he addresses this topic and this area where um, the Catholics seem to, there's no writing to prove, but seem to keep those and solidify those, canonize those at that time in the 16th century, um, because specifically some of those books validified their theological standings of praying to uh, saints and different things like that. Uh, the Reformation uh, brings protestants to remove those moving forward so that there's no confusion of that same those same topics so i don't know if that makes makes any yeah, sense thank there. you all right anybody who's uh who's on the call live um if you got a question go ahead and raise your hand i see a chat i had any looked. comments uh go ahead scott so it seems to be and i know this is getting into more of uh, modern day uh, translations of the Bible. Do you see there to be a um, a problem with a lot of translations that seem to uh, be um, doing a personalized translation, if you will? In other words, we're going to use this Hebrew name in this spot, and um, you know, I don't know if there's a, if there's a when that is done, I don't know if there's a um, 
a scholarly approach to that, um, or if it's just basically trying to uh, to make it a nice, nifty Hebrew type of a, a Bible. I'd like your opinion on that. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. That's that's actually a topic I love to talk about. Um, when it comes to translations of the Bible, I do a, obviously I'm, I'm doing my dissertation includes translational work, and uh, so I really love to talk about that. But um, when it comes to some of those Bibles you're talking about, and an overall concept for me in translations, I steer away from anyone who's doing a single translation from a single person. Uh, there's no accountability there. Um, the oldest translations that we had, uh, aside from like the really early ones, like Jerome, who's doing it alone out of necessity, uh, but even the oldest English translations we have are done by committee with checks and balances. Mm -hmm. um, so when we don't have that, I'll give you one exception. And I've read through the entire Old Testament in his translation. I disagree with a lot of his footnote, footnotes. But I'll give you one exception would be Robert Alter's Old Testament translation. Uh, he's considered one of the most uh, profound experts in, in Hebrew literature and the Hebrew Bible. Uh, he's Jewish. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think he's conservative Jewish. You know, he's not Christian. So he doesn't have a New Testament. He just has the Old Testament. So his footnotes are going to be uh, geared towards uh, non-acceptance for the Messiah. Uh, so that's that would be my only contention. But when it comes to the translation itself, it's good. When it comes to like sacred name translations and, and those type of things, there's only one that I really suggest to people. It's called the Tree of Life version. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, it was done by committee, had real scholars on it who had real, you know, educational background and linguistics like uh, Dr. Michael Brown and some others. And so that would be the one that that I always suggest um, for that. A lot of these other translations, I'm not going to name any. Uh, I don't want to go down that path, but right. a lot of these others that are being done by single people have no educational background in languages. They're not even really doing translations. Uh, I've looked through some of them. They're really taking like the King James, the New King James, and just replacing some words here and there um, arbitrarily, actually, sometimes. So um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's a great question, though. Thank you, Scott. All right, who else? We got a. I know you all have have some thoughts and questions. So you just go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes. Hey, Carlos, go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, hey Matt. Thanks, appreciate it for being here. So, what would you to me the way it sounds? Because a lot of people debate that the reason they don't want to read the scriptures or, you know, follow the way or any of these things is because look, man, that. That, that was written a long time ago. Translations, transliterations, people writing everywhere. So it, I'm, I've been thinking of a way to um, tell people that that may be true, but you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Is that the, uh, the, the saying? So at the end of the day, it's true, right? Like there's translations, there's different books, there's all this other stuff. It's true. Things might have been, you know, switched over time. There's... Um, not on purpose. It's just I think it's things get lost or in translation. But there's also the you know the culture, the the people, the language. There's all these things that put in place. But just because it just because that's the way it is, that doesn't mean you don't you stop seeking after his ways, right? Would you say that's true? And will you be? Will you then say afterwards like I look? I encourage you that even if you believe this, there's so much. Um, at the end of the day, our responsibility is to honor and glorify the creator. And you can't do that without digging into the scriptures. Yeah, that's right. And a lot of those are things, you know, talking points that kind of seep into the church from outside. Um, when we think about the credibility of the text, um, sure, it's been translated many times, but we're not talking about translations. No one would ever hold any work accountable to its translation, right? If I write a book in English and it gets translated wrongly in Japanese, nobody's holding me accountable to what its it translate what its translation says. So we have to deal with the text, the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek texts of of the Bible. And so when it comes to that, um, you know, transmissional errors are things that happen, but they're very minuscule and they really have no you know regard for um, the message of the text. 
you know, someone would point out, well, there's, you know, 10,000 manuscript differences in the Greek New Testament over time. We're talking about uh, very minuscule differences. Most of them, the overwhelming majority, over 90% of those differences can be uh, relegated to scribal error. And what I mean by that, um, you know, I write papers all the time and I pass them through Grammarly and I have someone else uh, preview my work as well. And I'll still have errors at the end of that, that through these great tools that we have today. But imagine an ancient scribe. And here's uh, one thing that I love if you, if you get to go through my course. I love the part where I talk about how scribes, you know, pass down these scrolls. So you had two methods. Uh, anciently, you would have Jay sitting there with one scroll and an empty scroll. And Jay is going to look over here and read it. And then he's going to look over here and write it, read it and write it, read it and write it. I mean, if I do that today, I'm going to have some errors. Uh, just try that out. Try doing that for two hours with any book and you're going to miss some things. Uh, you're going to put a word twice or you're going to skip a word. Those are the type of things that people talk about when they say that there are errors or you know differences in, in manuscripts. Over 90% are just that, looking back and forth. To try to correct that later on in, in uh, transmission history, Jay now would stand at the front of a room, and now me, Scott, and Carlos would be sitting there, and Jay would read it to us as we write it down. I would argue that's a little more accurate you're still going to have issues. You're still, I'm going to skip a word. Scott's going to add a word. You know, you're, you're still going to have that as you go about that process. So most of our manuscript uh, issues are with that. Our biggest manuscript issues come in with the Septuagint. Um, but I always point to the Dead Sea Scrolls as kind of uh, really kind of, excuse me, putting that at bay. Before that, we had some big issues with the Septuagint. You talk about Jeremiah, it has um, 3,000 less words in the book of Jeremiah and the Septuagint than in the Masoretic text. Uh, that's a big issue for us uh, until the Dead Sea Scrolls come along and, and they're very content, they're, they're virtually contemporary to the Septuagint and, and they have, you know, very close to what we have in the Masoretic text. So uh, I think we can trust, you know, understanding that history, understanding that these manuscript errors are virtually and widely uh, uh, errors of, uh, transmission uh, really puts at bay a lot of that that's been able uh, to be put before us. Uh, the other thing that I always point out is nobody ever questions Homer's work or Shakespeare's work. These are works that come much later in transmission than the New Testament, especially. The Old Testament's arguable, uh, but they have so very few. I can't remember, you know, Homer's uh, manuscript copies come from thousands of years later, and they have like a dozen manuscripts compared to the thousands of manuscripts we have. It's really ridiculous the way that gets presented to us. I think it's um, not very, um, I can't have lost the word I was looking for. It's not very faithful to a uh, reasonable conversation on the topic. Great question, though. I, ho I hope that that response helped you a little bit, Carlos. No, I, I yeah, I, I did. I, I like that part of um, what you talked about transmission. I'm gonna have to dig into that a little bit more to um, to work into my thought. And I agree with you also because I've thought about that too. If somebody ever argues with me and tell them, I said, well, and what about you know, so many other like like Homer, like you said, so many other um, uh, books out there that you know been written, even faith books that were written you know hundreds of years afterwards and. I come at everybody just kind of lets those things go a little bit, uh, but the scriptures, they hit it hard. Um, a quick question though, if if somebody that's starting, because, you know, nobody's going to take, I don't say nobody, it, it's really hard to take the time to go back and forth and and look at transmission, translations, transliteration, so on. Somebody that's started off, what version of the English um, um, would you recommend people start off with? Uh, for me today, um, I really like the CSB, Christian Standard Bible. It's it's uh, pretty pretty middle ground for uh, thought for thought, word for word. Uh, um, it's not so wooden or so literal that people can't understand it. Uh, 
but it's also not so fluid that people don't get the full meaning from the text. So that's my go-to. So I preach from the CSB and I study from the NRSV updated edition. Uh, the NRSV is kind of the scholar's Bible, but, but I always get that question. But yeah, CSB, my kids read from a New Living Translation. It's more appropriate for their age. I, I like the New Living Translation. Um, my least favorite translation, I'm, I'm stepping on Tim Hague's toes here uh, in a couple of weeks. My least favorite translation is the New King, New King James Version. It's the Bible I cut my teeth on. I had it rebound and I keep it for safekeeping because it has all these historical notes from me and how I was studying years ago, but um, I don't really like it. They took all of the good stuff out, the glorious language of the King James Version, and they uh, put a bunch of bad stuff in, you know, mistranslations and stuff. So, but yeah, CSB, that's what I would, um, right. That's what I recommend usually for an, a modern adult today, uh, CSB. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carlos. Good question. Yeah, and just for those who have come in later, um, as a note, we are being recorded and it's being live streamed to YouTube, just so you know. And on the 28th, we're going to have Tim Haig on to talk about modern English translations and, you know, what makes what makes a good translations, which ones are good, which ones maybe not so good. Um, and I suspect there's going to be a lot of agreement between Matt and Tim on that topic. Um, I was going to say, I, I, I'm going to tune in because I'd be interested. I, I have a lot of respect for him and I'll be interested in his thoughts on on those, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Who else we got? You can go ahead, Scott. I'm sorry. I, you swerved into a your your, your description uh, made me think of another question. Um, do you give credence because you've given a, an explanation of how the Bible was created, and um, many will look to the uh, the Bible as a whole, Old Testament more than New Testament, and they're going to point to numerology. Well, given how you've described um its creation it seems to me very um unlikely that that's a legitimate um a, a legitimate science if you will any thoughts uh, are you talking well, about like bible codes bible yes. codes exactly okay yeah I, i'm not really into bible codes they really fall apart because um you know yeah. a certain bible codes only going to work if you use one a uh, specific manuscript uh, or if you use it in a certain order right or a certain order or yeah, yeah. okay that's what yeah. i thought um I, i'm not really into that i try not to just totally uh discredit people that find um some type of inspiration in that um but i also have a really um uh, i'm compelled to be faithful to what i know to be true you know so I, I don't mm -hmm. think that the Bible was intended to have a code. Um, and, and again, it depends on the order of things. Um, exactly. Yeah. This helps. You know, um, the order of the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish Bible, for example, versus our he our English Old Testament. Uh, that's different. Mm -hmm. um, and then you take which manuscript or which version at what time and, and where we get it from. So yeah, it kind of it kind of goes against that. I wasn't sure. I had I had the same follow up question as Jay. If you're talking about the meanings um, or the significance of numbers in Scripture, I would say that there is a legitimate thing for that. Um, that there's a uh, you know meanings to some numbers, but I also approach that with caution. Sometimes we take that a little too far. Um, I would say when it comes to language, this is I didn't ask Jay if I could touch on this, but uh, when it comes to individual meanings for letters. Uh, that's something that just historically we don't see until the Middle Ages and ancient Hebrew readers and, and hearers uh, had no understanding of meaning within an individual letters. They understood the message of language like we're talking, you know, right now. So, uh, but great question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Yeah, I don't, um, just to kind of underscore some of what you're saying there, I don't, I, I'm a, pretty skeptical of a lot of things like that, but I hesitate to just rule them out. Um, yeah. you know, th I know some very intelligent people, you know, engineers, scientists who are all into the Bible codes. Mm -hmm. I 
I, it doesn't seem reasonable to me, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong. Uh, but what I think is really important is to remember that what was the meaning that the author was trying to get across? What, what was God trying to tell people? And did people in you know, 500 BC or in the first century AD, did they have the capability to understand these things? And if not, then it's probably not the main message. Maybe it's a real thing, maybe it's not, but it's, it's a bonus. It, it's not the actual scripture. The scripture are, is the message that God intended for people to understand by reading it. Man, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, because if Bible codes are a thing, then only us today with computers could understand that that concept. And when it comes to hermeneutics, or, or uh, when it comes to uh, man, it's late. My mind's going blank. What's the word I'm looking for, Jay? Uh, extrapolating the the meaning of the text. Um, uh, exegesis. Thank you. When it comes to exegesis, our understanding of the text has to start with the first hearers of the text. Uh, how did the original author understand or intend for it to be understood? But also, how did the first hearers understand it? Uh, they never could have understood a Bible code within a within a text, but they could understand whenever they heard a story about a king or a promise of a king, and then later hear an instruction for a king. And then later hear stories about kings. They can connect those types of things. They can connect stories. And so I think that's where you see. I, I try to, again, like Jay, I try to be gracious with people when they find in, uh, meaning and inspiration in some of those things. My my brain doesn't work that way. And I just can't see that in the ancient, ancient concept. But to their approach, I do in my, my form of study see the same type of thing in the literary structure of the Bible where God intentionally weaves stories in a certain way um, so that so that those hearers would understand, oh wait, so when David slays Goliath, Goliath should be understood as this really giant serpent. And so now the hearers who heard the story of Genesis, they see the God's uh, pro his promise is partially fulfilled in that moment. And so those are the kinds of things that I can I kind of get down with. And and so that's why I'm a little gracious to some of those other concepts that maybe I don't necessarily agree with. Yep. Thank you, Scott. All right. We have any other questions? Anything anybody wants to add? Well, I like this is Ken. Hey, um, Ken. Welcome. I, my, my apologies for being late, uh, but I just joined in. I like his uh, the, your approach on the, the Bible codes and things of that nature. And I'm, and I'm not against those things. Just like you said, if someone finds inspiration in those things, it, I think it's okay. However, it's just like the Bible is meant to be read. Uh, the, you know, the other stuff that I think we can, uh, we can kind of mystify it in a sense and make it uh, be de way deeper than it really is. But, you know, the Bible is simple. It's, you know, and it's meant for us to understand it, not for us to be, you know, for it to be uh, a mystery. Mm. That's good. Yep, good observation. Jad, yeah, I didn't know, you, you mentioned something about some specific examples of translational things. I didn't know if you wanted, you intended to go down that road, uh, like with names or. Um, yeah, um, I wasn't. As, sure as long as we, we still have a little bit of time. Um, one of the things that comes up online, you know, Facebook groups and whatever social media you're on, I'm sure that you've seen it. Um, you know, most scholars will say that. Yeshua or Jesus was known in his lifetime as Yeshua or Yeshu, depending on which dialect of, of Hebrew or Aramaic they mm -hmm. were speaking. Um, but how do we get from that to Jesus? I mean, the, the oh, names yeah. don't even sound alike. That's right. Yeah, they don't sound any, anywhere close to it. Um, so I, I come from a tradition, at least for the past, you know, almost 20 years of saying Yeshua um, which is somewhat of a uh, rendering of the Hebrew name for uh, Jesus. 
And I think, you know, early on, I kind of went, I had that same question. They're so far apart. Like, how could I even give honor to a name, Jesus, if his name's Yeshua? Uh, it was in my Septuagint studies, actually, where I kind of had like this aha moment when I looked in the Old Testament. And Jesus is how it's written in Greek. So if you look up uh, the name for Yeshua in the New Testament, the Greek New Testament, um, you'll see Jesus is the uh, rendering there. But you find Jesus in the Old Testament when we look at the Septuagint, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Um, Jesus is used for both Joshua and Josh, <laughs> um, which, is, which is unique. Um, but you have like Joshua, son of Nun. So Joshua in Hebrew it would be Yehoshua. So some people actually call Jesus Yehoshua. I'm sure you've seen that, um, which I, I'm not totally opposed to. Um, because yes, uh, Jesus is used for both Joshua, but later, I think it's Nehemiah, um, the author of Nehemiah chapter eight, I think, or nine, refers to Joshua, the son of Nun, as Yeshua, the son of Nun, uh, shortens the name. Uh, Joshua and Yeshua, uh, and Yeshua have similar but different meanings, but we obviously see that they have this shortening of names that happens. Um, you know, Yehoshua can be Yeshua. I think it's the King James Version, actually, that puts uh, in Nehemiah, uh, Jeshua, instead of Joshua, it puts uh, J-E, it's like Yeshua with a J, uh, which is interesting. But you see Jesus being used for both of those. Uh, the shortening of names is an interesting thing. We do that today. My name is Matthew, but I go by Matt. Um, we have uh, William can be Bill or Will. We had, which is interesting for Jacob, Yaakov, we, we talked about as well. William can be Bill or Will. We have uh, Daniel can be Dan. But we don't think about that anciently, or at least I haven't. I always thought that was a modern thing. But even into the first century, uh, Joseph, Yosef, uh, there was basically a, a shortened name of Joseph in the first century that was very common. It was essentially Joseph and Joe. And so we have uh, the, the Hebrew Yehoshua or Yeshua, but virtually the same name uh, becomes Jesus in Greek. Now, this is a transliteration. They don't have a sh sound in Greek. Um, so uh, Yeshua becomes Jesus. Um, and then you come into Latin. We talked about Jerome, where Latin Jesus in Greek becomes Jesus, um, I-E-S-U-S -S in Latin. Um, and that just transliterates over into English from Latin. So I-E-S-U-S -S, uh, eventually becomes J-E-S-U-S. -S. And so everybody says, well, the J wasn't uh, invented until 600 years ago or, or whatever it is, you know. Um, that's not even important. Uh, that doesn't even mean anything. Um, some of the, some of the uh, arguments that I see are like, well, if his name was Yeshua, that's what we should call him. Even if Jesus is a proper English transliteration, we shouldn't use it uh, because nobody would call him Jesus at any point. Uh, but that's not even accurate either. Um, today, if I go uh, to a foreign country uh, and I say Matthew, they're going to kind of, uh, some people may understand what I mean, but they're actually going to repeat back to me, oh, okay, I'm out at Yahoo. You know, like they're going to say what they're familiar with. And nobody ever stops a foreigner and says, no, 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 you can't say that. You have to say Matthew. Um, we don't do that today. We act like we do, but we don't. Um, if we travel, and I've been to many countries, I've never done that, never seen anyone else do that. And so transliteration is something that happens fluidly today, and it's something that happened back then. So uh, you just have this stream that goes from Hebrew, Yehoshua, or Yeshua, one of the two, into Jesus. Um, into Greek goes Latin Jesus and then uh, Iesus or you know and eventually has a J in English. Uh, that's a natural you know progression in English. The I to the J is actually actually a natural progression that doesn't have anything to do with the name but has to do with the English language um, and how the English language progressed. So I think that does that kind of answer the question? I know that's still, like we talked earlier, I think that's still, some people won't get that concept, but hopefully that helps some. Yeah, I know, just as a, a more modern, another modern illustration, uh, I, I used to work with a number of Russians, and they don't have the letter J in Russian. 
So when they would say my name, they would say je or de je, depending on how they thought of it. And usually when it was transliterated, it was translated into what would look like in English D Z H E Y, mm -hmm. which you know looks pretty strange to an English speaker, but in Russian, that's the closest they can get to the to the letter J or to the English sound J. And that sort of thing happens all the time when you're trying to translate between languages that use different alphabets, it, and especially when they have different sounds for those letters. Mm -hmm. That's a really great example. I'm going to steal that example because that's more extreme than Matthew and Matityahu. For me, that's more extreme. The the J J A Y to D A what is it D Z H E Y? Right. Yeah, that's more extreme. That's really good, but. You would never stop them and say, you can't say it like that or spell it like that, right? Yeah. No, they wouldn't appreciate it. <laughs> That's right. I, I don't know how much time we have. I mean, I could, what time are you wanting to stop? Uh, well, we've been, it's an hour and a half now. Um, we can go a little bit longer if you're up for it. Uh, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to hold people too long. Hey, oh, Matt, yeah, ahead, uh, I was, I know I'm late to the party, so uh bear with me. I wanted to, um, first of all, thank you for that very clear and direct explanation of the etymological journey <laughs> of the name. Um, I grew up in a oneness Pentecostal house, Jesus only, and mm -hmm. it always bothered me um, how there was this uh, so certainty about Jesus, and yet it was such a relatively new movement that just didn't make sense historically. Um, but I guess this is more of a I want to make a comment than I want to ask a question. So, yeah, but this, that that as you were explaining that, sort of the correlation that I made in my mind was that this fixation that people have on this one bit of information that <clears throat> without understanding the the journey of the, the evolution of language how it got there and how that impacts their study of the word and their unwillingness to examine concepts and understandings and, and beliefs beyond that plain reading or beyond their preferred translation or all of that kind of stuff and I guess that maybe that ties into the whole conversation but even just that one place, I guess maybe just that one piece, that one explanation that you gave, which I'll probably replay a couple of times to solidify that explanation so I can parrot it back and give you credit and be, I am quoting that. Um, <laughs> but, but just be, that being a really great way to start this, the conversation about why it's important to expand your understanding of the history of, of the word and where things come from. So. I hope that made sense. I've had a lot of words on my plate today. So I just wanted to, to thank you for, for that. No, that, that made sense. I appreciate your comments. Uh, one that, that I could even add to that, that I would try to, to make shorter um, or, or do it in quick fashion would be the name James for the New Testament. Uh, I actually started my fall series on history of the Bible that I had already taught and was available, but I taught it in person and live streamed it for our, from our church because a lady asked me, she said, have you ever heard that King James required his name to be in the Bible and changed the name for the book of James to be his? And I just, I've, I've heard this many times, so I just smiled and waved and said, let's let's talk about it later. And so I started a class and I told her I was up front, I said, we're going to start a class based on a question. But um, just that nature, if you look at the etymology of the word James, uh, it actually goes back to Yaakov, which is Jacob. And so you have two streams that happen. Um, if you go from Yaakov in Hebrew to Greek to English, you end up with Jacob. But if you stop along the way in Latin, which most Bibles in the ancient world are, are in, in uh, I said the ancient world, uh, it is ancient, but uh, in the but pre, um, in the early English Bibles. Um, if you stop off in Latin like most of them do, uh, then you end up with James. So they James and Jacob have the same etymological root, Yaakov in Hebrew. Uh, there's not a great conspiracy, and it's easily seen if you just go back to as far as Tyndale, the first English translation, and he as well has 
that book named James or it's I A M E S uh, for him. Uh, and this is over a hundred years before King James is born. So uh, there's no insistence that King James is, is requiring it to be written. Um, it really is an etymological route that ends up there. Yeah, the letter J seems to trip people up. I, from my understanding, I mean, the the evolution of the I into the J is a little cloudy. You know, some some guy, you know, thought, you know, we we're using this I as a consonant at the beginning of words. Maybe we just put a little tail on the end of it to show that it's a consonant. But mm -hmm. in Celtic languages sometimes that beginning I takes on a Y, a J sound. In a lot of Hispanic dialects do this today. So in Central America, a lot of places, if somebody says yes, they'll say yes. Mm -hmm. And so that Yaakov becomes Jacobus, which becomes Yamas, which becomes James, to somebody with who's speaking a Germanic language with a Celtic accent, which is English. <laughs> My my two year old right now says yes, uh, with the same, uh, and that's a natural thing that happens. Um, to to that's that's more natural to the tongue than yes. Uh, yes is more natural. It happens easier in language. I think on the flip side too, something worth noting, and and I don't know if your listeners or your people in your Bible study go through this as well. There's like on the flip side where people say that if things sound the same, they have inherent meaning. Right. Uh, we say amen at the end of a prayer. There's a God in ancient Egypt whose name's Amen. And so people may connect those and say that the word amen is bad. Uh, and if I'm going somewhere, you don't want me to go, Jay, that, you know, stop me. But I think when it You're comes good. to language, uh, very important to understand that that's not how translation works. That's not how transliteration works or language in general works. Just because two, um, Two things, words from different languages sound the same, does not necessitate an inherent meaning that's uh, or, or an etymological meaning for both that is the same. Uh, this actually doesn't even happen in the same language. Hebrew has a lot of homonyms uh, that have no meaning connected to each other. Um, but one modern thing you brought up some uh, you brought up Celtic and some other languages. Uh, this may seem a little crude, but if you go to, um, is it Sweden, I think. So I was a runner back in my day. I ran cross country as a through high school and one year of college. And we had um, a speed work called Fartlick. It was uh, speed play was the name of the workout. It was just a speed workout where the, the person in the back would uh, sprint forward and they would lead a sprint for so many seconds, or just, excuse me, the person in the front would lead a sprint for so many seconds, drop to the back. And you would just have a, a rotation of sprints. Um, but if you go there today, uh, because fart lek, speed play, uh, there are fart signs. Uh, you know, those are speed signs, speed limit signs. We can't associate uh, the English word that sounds similar uh, to that, that in that language. It doesn't make any sense, nor should it. One of the most concerning ones lately is um, like, NASA. Uh, NASA doesn't mean, I think uh, the, the meme I saw was like NASA, like N-A-S-A means um, to deceive in Hebrew, uh, but it doesn't. Uh, it actually means to lift up, which is, <laughs> which is almost a funny twist of irony for that, but it means to lift up. Nasha, because there's, uh, depending on uh, the way the Hebrew is formed, Nasha means to deceive. And so uh, not that that would ever have credibility in language. You couldn't especially take two word, a word in English and say that it has the same meaning because it sounds the same in Hebrew, but you definitely couldn't take an acronym in English and, and propose the same thing. So those are important things to remember too. Just some general uh, linguistic things on both sides of that to help us understand some things we may come across. Thank you. All right. Well, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, then Jay, I would, I would yeah, take the ahead. time for, for a question. I'm a big resource guy mm -hmm. because I've learned from so many people, and I always just want to help people learn on their own. Uh, 
Uh, you don't have to come to Matt to learn about the history of the Bible. So I always give resources. I have a big stack here, about a dozen books on history of the Bible, but I just want to give you the three main ones. And I always give them in order of like um, scholarly level, you know, what's the easiest to read, what's the hardest to read. So the first one I mentioned earlier, how we got the Bible, it's by Lightfoot. Uh, that is what I give when I teach the class. I, you know, ask people to buy that book. It's less than 20 bucks. It's like 19 bucks on Amazon. Um, very easy to understand book. will cover a lot of very valuable information. Um, then a step up from that would be, uh, there's an author called, Way I forgot his first name. Excuse me. I think I pulled it up earlier. So I would remember his first name. It's, um, here it is. Uh, Paul Wegner. Paul Wegner, The Journey from Text to Translations, The Origin and Development of the Bible. That's actually the book that I use to kind of create my workflow for my class. So it has a lot more detail, but it has uh, some more scholarly information in it than, than what Lightfoot's. But what I love about The Journey from Text to Translation is it has a lot of charts. I love charts. People can see and visualize things better with charts. Um, and then it ends, the end of that book goes into modern English translations. The only problem with it is it was published in 2004. So it's missing, you know, the CSB, the NASB 2020, the newest NIV, you know, it's missing some of those more modern translations. But those, you know, that would be the kind of the middle ground. And then if you want a really technical and heavy look at it, it would be John Barton, B-A-R-T-O-N, A History of the Bible, the Story of the World's Most Influential book. So I could give you many more, but I always like to give a range for people, especially if there's an audience that's uh, got a range of um, experience with Bible study. So I appreciate you, you letting me do that. And last question. Yeah, and I'll, I will, uh, I'll put, uh, I'll find some links to those books and put that in the, uh, in the video description later. Oh, okay, uh, great. Yeah. Yeah. I'll also include a link to Lighthouse Messianic Fellowship. If if you are in the Monroe, Louisiana, uh, you know, look them up. You can visit Matt in person, uh, only with the best intentions, of course. Don't hurt him. Uh, I'm a very I'm hospitable kidding. person, too. Not, you're, not that anybody yeah. would want to do that. Yeah, if you're passing through Monroe down I-20, please call me. I tell people this all the time. Uh, I love to have people here. Our community is very welcoming. We have We try to have the hospitality of Abraham. Um, I had a whole family of strangers live in my house for 15 months. Uh, we have people that pass through and stay here all the time or stay at other people's homes. So you don't have to buy a place to, to stay. Actually, next weekend, I have somebody passing through. They're staying at my house. We have RV hookups at the church as well. Um, so I always like to express that because we love to uh, facilitate, you know, travelers. And, and I'll definitely have you for meals and stuff like that. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a reminder on the 28th, we've got Tim Haig to talk about uh, some modern Bible translations. So we're going to go deeper into that topic and going to talk about the, the CSB and ESV and NIV and all the other V's. And we've got uh, Proverbs 28 Bible study Thursday night, 7 p.m. Central. So I hope you can join us for that too. And thank you again, Matt. Uh, this was a great conversation and I wish we could keep going for a couple more hours, but everybody's got to go to bed sometime. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's been an honor. I really appreciate it. You are most welcome. All right. Thank you everybody for being here. Really do appreciate you joining us.